received a great from it. Um, it's a topic of huge interest for our clients at the moment, as they get to grips with reporting all the work they're doing on both environmental and social issues. And we have a great uh, mix of Irish companies online today, both our own clients and those that are active through the CDP Ireland network. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Shay McGann and I'm responsible for sustainability strategy and reporting with Clearstream Solutions. And today I'm going to take a couple of minutes at the start just to give you an overview of the emerging sustainability reporting trends the regulatory developments and the voluntary frameworks that very much dominate the space. We'll then be joined from, we'll then be joined by Kate uh, in GRI to give us a deep dive on the, the standards. Um, and following on from this will be a conversation with two uh, Irish corporates that are very active um, in this space and on their sustainability reporting journey. They're uh, Karen Holmes and ESB. Uh, so, um, yes, so um, just, just to introduce the panellists again, we've Kate, who's Corporate, corporate and Stakeholder Manage Engagement Manager with GRI, GRI um, and then we'll be joined by Susie Crawford, ESG Reporting and Research Manager at Karen Holmes PLC, and Cormac Madden, Environmental and Sustainability Manager with ESB. So just a bit of an overview uh, to, to, to set the scene. Um, I'm just going to look at some of the key trends in sustainability reporting. So, the, so there's, there, there's eight here. Um, I could probably have filled about three pages of three bubble, three pages of bubbles um, with the trends that are happening. Every time I give a presentation on this, I, I need to update the slides as is, as the is the pace of change. Um, it's a really dynamic space. Um, but I think some of some of the the, the trends are quite uh, uh, we're, they're they're kind of developing they've they uh, over the last number of years. I think the first is very much that need uh, for investors to get reliable, accessible, and comparable ESG data to make their investment decisions. Um, We've then got all of the, the, the work that's happening at a global level, that the global climate ambition and national targets. So uh, countries uh, are setting net zero uh, targets to become net zero by certain dates, 2050. I think Ireland has set the target for, um, and then companies are setting more medium term tar science based targets to, to, to support these global ambition. Uh, we've then got the, I suppose, the, the, the trend that we're seeing a lot over the last 12 months is that companies are starting to mature from reporting their internal uh, performance to measuring external value chain, chain impacts. So a lot of the work they're doing around scope three assessments and, and the regulation that, that's coming, the, the corporate sustainability due diligence, which will require companies to assess their environmental and social impacts within their supply chain. We've then got, I suppose, the, the, the trend that's driving a lot, a lot of the reason why many of you are participating today. Uh, companies have been asked by their, by their customers to report their sustainability performance, whether that's in tenders or prequels. Um, and also, you may have seen in the UK, they've come out with their social impact model, which is basically asking suppliers who, um, who, are, who, are, who are tendering what is their in, what 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 impact the project is going to have from a social and environmental perspective? Uh, obviously, the re re regulation usually hoover hoovers up the laggards, but we're seeing real ambition in this space, uh, predominantly from the EU, but there's also developments uh, at a at a global level. So, uh, the the SFDR, uh, the the, the uh, which is apl applicable for investors, so. The Sustainable Finance Disclosures Regulation, um, the CSRD, uh, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which will replace um, the, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, which is currently in place for, for large companies, and the EU Taxonomy, uh, which came into force uh, this, this year. And... 
apologies, my computer has. Frozen. Um, we we then see uh, that this is a really interesting trend. Um, the 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 ambition by the EU to bring sustainability information in line with uh, financial information. So uh, the, to to include them for them to be on equal footing in the annual report and to have the 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 the, the regulation and the 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 the, the, the I suppose the the. the the same kind of rigor on on your your sustainability sustainability information is financial. So the the, the CSRD last week um, announced that it will have much stricter requirements for sustainability reporting. Obviously, there's the the EU sustainability reporting standards. Uh, they're going to have more requirements around materiality and the whole double materiality concept. And then there will also be assurance required for this non-financial information as well. So the details haven't been figured out, but um, the, the, the ambition to, to put this in place is, is there. And then finally, I suppose we're seeing a, a really big uptake in the use of the voluntary platforms and standards. So CDP, Ecovetus, um, GRI, SASB, science-based targets, the task force on climate-related financial disclosures, um, all of these reporting frameworks and standards are, are, are being adopted by, not, it, it used to be just the, the large companies that were, were engaging, but we've seen a real trickle down, down effect um, and um, quite a broad range of companies are, are now using these, these frameworks. So just, just to, to focus on um, ESG reporting regulation for a few moments. Um, firstly, the EU. So at an EU level, uh, there is a lot happening. Uh, it seems like nearly weekly there's new announcements. So last year, uh, the Q2 of last year, the EU announced the, the CSRD, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, that it would replace the, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive and GRI were invited to collaborate on these, the, these new standards. In January of this year, we saw the, the EU taxonomy come into force. So companies had to report on their eligibility for the first two, uh, two objectives of the taxonomy, which were climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. So I think there was a, a, a the, yeah, it was, challenging i think for, for for companies to do this you have to to um to uh, i suppose to, to your turnover your capex and opex in terms of your environmental activities and percentages so uh i think we'll see a a, a lot a lot happening in this place in this space um in october uh the european sustainability reporting standards which have been developed by efrag and gri uh, for the CSRD uh, are due to be published. The consultation is open at the moment. Then ne next year, uh, there'll be further requirements from an EU taxonomy perspective. There'll, there'll be the six and six environmental objectives will have to be considered, and you'll have to say whether you actually align um, with, the, with the with the activities that they've listed. And again, this will be this will be applicable for those covered under those companies covered by the NFRD. And then in January 2024, the, the Corporate Sustainability Report, Reporting Directive will come into to force. So as part of this, the, the concept of double materiality will have to be considered. There'll be assurance requirements. And then the following year, um, this the, the directive will apply to a much wider pool of companies. And then just from a global perspective, uh, the IFRS uh, are leading the, the way on this. They established their International Sustainability Standards Board at, um, at COP26 last November. Um, this, was, uh, this was a real, uh, I suppose, line in the sand in terms of bringing together, consolidating a number of the reporting frameworks. So the likes of SASB and the integrated reporting framework uh, formed up into the Value Foundation, Val, um, Value Reporting Foundation, which has become part of the ISSB. Um, 
the US Securities and Exchange Commission um, just in March announced the creation of a climate and ESG task force to, try, to identify ESG related misconduct. Um, and then the IFRS are expected to publish their, their first two standards uh, by the end of the year. So the, there'll be one on general sustainability and one that's specifically climate related disclosures. And their consultation process is, is currently open. It's been open since the end of March. So as you can see, a, a, a lot happening in, in, um, in, in the regulatory space. So lots of you may have already seen versions of this slide. Again, it's another one that's constantly updated. Uh, but just for, you, for, for people on the call who are struggling to, to put these uh, all the ver all the various frameworks and standards and regulation in um, to kind of get get them to understand them. I, I often find this slide can be can be good at explaining. So from a regulatory perspective, at a global level, you've got the IFRS who are leading the 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 charge there with the the International Sustainability Standards Board. You've got the EU then who've got a rake of regulation that a reporting sustainability reporting regulation that applies to both corporates and investors and then the UK as well are are a leading as well at leading kind of their own sustainability reporting regulation um, and they've made the TCFD mandatory then in terms of voluntary reporting frameworks and standards so there there's a mixture here I suppose of of frameworks, which are the likes of the, the sustainable, sustainable development goals are often used as a, as, a, as a good broad framework for creating sustainability reports. Uh, you've, from a climate perspective, you've got the, the, the TCFD and the task force. So, so for a framework for disclosing your environmental um, and climate risk information. Then um, from a standards perspective, you've got GRI and SASB uh, and, uh, I, other frameworks such as ISO, um, more traditional frameworks, and then there's the integrated reporting framework for integrating sustainability information into your annual report. You've then got the ESG ratings and indices, so probably more applicable if you're um, a PLC, but uh, all of these companies, MSCI, Sustainalytics, are, are rating, rating your sustainability performance um, in terms of the impact in terms of the environmental and social impacts um, on your business. And then finally, benchmarks and reporting platforms. So uh, this is a little bit of a catch-all category, but the likes of questionnaires and like CDP uh, for your environmental information and, and science-based targets, down to supplier platforms like ZX and Ecovatus. And then there's lots of different um, sectoral uh, platforms like the I put Bresp in there the, for the construction sector. Um, it's quite a, a, a common uh, benchmarking uh, platform. So it's by no means comprehensive, but it's a it's a good way to to, to structure it or to, to think about it in your own head. Um, and then the, this is, I suppose, just another way that we kind of like to, to, to show show our clients it. So this graph maps the prescriptiveness of the various reporting frameworks against their scope. So you'll see in the top right hand corner, you've got CDP, uh, which is obviously prescriptive in that it's a questionnaire um, and it's, it's, it's very focused in scope as it's just environmental. Um, and then down the bottom uh, left hand corner, you've got GRI. So it's uh, it, 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 they're, they're a set of standards. You do a materiality to use them. So they're much more flexible um, and they, they're, they're broader in terms of they, they incorporate, incorporate ES and G. Um, but a lot of them are investor focused. The investors are all looking for that reliable and consistent uh, data sets so they they use the information that that companies feed into these frameworks to create their investment products uh, so just a, a, a quick um, a short deep dive before we get into GRI but I suppose one of the questions we get we get asked uh, is what frameworks and standards 
should we use for our business? It seems like there are so so many when companies first get into this space, but they they all have their own um, benefits and uh, they could be all used slightly differently. So just to give you a bit of a, an overview of that. So the first one here we have is GRI. Um, it's a set of like of standards, like they've e universal standards, economic, environmental and social, and I won't go into them too much because Kate's going to get into that. Um, but they they're 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 broad. They're they focus on um, economic, social, and environmental issues. And if you report in line with them, you're providing information to all your stakeholders. You've then got the SASB standards, which now sit under the Value Reporting Foundation. So these are seventy seven set sets of industry specific standards. So basically, SASB have done the materiality for your sector. Um, and they they will tell you the topics to report on um, and they very much have been selected um, based on whether or not they impact the, the, the or whether or not these topics will impact the financial performance of your 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 company so the scope I suppose financially material issues and the stakeholders are predominantly investors they were set up to to provide investors with this information um, you'll see SASB uh, tables in lots of sustainability reports or, or annual reports that you look at. It's often just uh, one, a, a page, uh, a, t a table. Uh, there's, there, there's significantly less work in, in responding to, um, to say, SASB than GRI, but maybe, maybe the benefits are, 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 are less. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one that companies often start with. You've then got CDP, which is at the disclosure of environmental information through questionnaires uh, with the ability to benchmark against peers and engage your supply chain. So basically what that means is CDP is three questionnaires, climate, biodiversity and water. Um, you, you are scored on, on your response um, and you can you, 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 rec yeah, you receive a the scores usually come out in around December time frame um, and you annually do this report report your your information to CDP and then they have a supply chain program so if you're a company that wants to engage with your supply chain you can use CDP to do so it's all environmental information so um focused from that perspective and and the general uh, stakeholders that it would appeal to or that would be familiar with it would be your invest investors and your customers uh, we've done the sustainable development goals. So these are broad goals that are part of the 2030 UN Agenda for Sustainable Development. So very much originally they were designed for um, countries and regions to, uh, to, to kind of track progress against global issues, but they've been adopted as a, as a really good framework for, for companies to, to, to measure their progress against such issues. Um, so yeah, very much a, a, a framework. You don't need to to you can you can decide how your issues align to the the, the various goals. Uh, there, there's no set way to to do this, but they they did they do have a very broad scope: economic, social, and environmental. And and the benefit of them is that they're generally recognised by anybody who's reading your sustainability report. Everyone from investors to people from general society. And the final one uh, is the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFD. So this is a framework for disclosing the impact of climate related risk on your business. Um, so again, it can be just a table uh, and it's got 11 guiding principles in it. And then you can talk to talk about how you're addressing each of those uh, each, each of those principles within your report. So it's in, in, it still environment focused and it's predominantly investors that are interested in, in this information and that would be aware of this framework. So finally, just to, um, to finish, uh, if you are considering doing a sustainability report, uh, it doesn't have to be 200 pages long and report to all these frameworks in the first year. Um, you can start small, and but I think there are a few must-haves or at least 
things that you're trying to work towards. Uh, it must have kind of clear governance and, and management commitment aligned with values, should be complete and material. So you're reporting on the issues that, that are important for your business. Um, stakeholder engagement is important. So materiality and, and asking your audience, Robust data collection and verification, particularly around some of your, your footprint and, and uh, your, your climate targets. Uh, using the, the right framework for your business and methodology, whether that's SASB or GRI or some of the other frameworks. Uh, showing evidence of policy and performance, including the challenges. Um, KPI, so that move from reporting and metrics to targets and, um, and, and, and KPIs. And just, yeah, transparency and authenticity is, is, is really important. So make sure you're talking about your challenges as well as your successes. So I'm going to hand over to Kate now, who uh, is going to give us an overview of the GRI standards and some of the work she's doing. Thank you very much, Shay. Um, now, can I just ask if you are you seeing my screen, my slides? Correctly, yeah. It's working. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, quick kudos to you on the on that overview of the landscape just then. That's no no easy feat given the uh, the number of moving uh, parts. So. Um, well done, and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, pleased to be here. So I hope I can also add some uh, some further clarity uh, to the audience. Um, so as she introduced, my name is Kate Reeson, and I am the manager of corporate and stakeholder engagement with GRI, which really means that uh, I get the opportunity to speak with a broad range of um, of our stakeholders around the world, including um, in Ireland and, and the UK. And so my pleasure to speak with the. Uh, with you today and give you an update on, um, you know, a little bit, talk a little bit about actually GRI and the GRI standards. Um, and in doing so, hopefully uh, be able to answer some of the questions that may be um, on your mind. So uh, just a little bit of background on who we are. Uh, we are an independent organization. And I guess we, we say we pioneered the, um, you know, the idea of sustainability reporting probably about 20 years ago back in the wake of the Exxon Valdez oil disaster, um, if anybody recalls that, um, from you know, at, around that time, people really wanted to start demanding greater scrutiny around corporate behavior. Um, and so today we offer the most commonly used global sustainability disclosure framework, um, helping companies to me to ultimately be more transparent the sustainability impacts on the economy, environment, and people. And that includes um, impacts on, on human rights. Uh, the GRI standards are great because uh, they help any business, um, irrespective of, of where you may be based geographically, your size, your sector, um, help you to dis disclose the impacts, um, which in turn, as we know, provides relevant insights for the company um, as well as as its stakeholders, um, and I think, of course, it's these it's the power of these insights which can subsequently you know, help inform decision making and um, and really improve social, um, environmental, and well, I think ultimately financial um, outcomes. Um, I just uh, wanted to throw in a few stats on the adoption of the GRI standards, um, just simply because take up is 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 is, is fastly increasing, uh, which is a good thing uh, to see uh, uh, trends, you know, transparency really uh, taking shape. If you do look at the interest um, in our standards there, um, which are, uh, for those who don't know, they are freely and publicly available. And last year, um, the standards were downloaded probably right close to 700,000 times. And for anybody who is interested, um, it's the actual the S, the, uh, the the social topics, which um, which tend to be downloaded the most uh, at the moment. Um, I'm just going to dive into the standards themselves um, because I guess uh, really key to the to the to what we're seeing as a widespread adoption of the standards is um, what you can see here on the screen. Our really sort of multi stakeholder approach. Um, I think that's what's really enabled the, um, the standards to resonate and to be um, as robust as, as they are. Um, 
having this approach essentially means we bring in the inputs and expertise from a very large range of constituency. Um, you can see them all here, including civil society, business, um, investment institutions. And that in turn um, means that the standards then also reflect the broad range of information needs um, of these stakeholders as well. Um, this, the GRI standards, are uh, just a visual representation. Um, you can see that they're, uh, they're mod modular in their nature and um, that they include, uh, so altogether they include the, the three universal standards, which you see there in green. And these are the standards which really apply to all organizations. Um, and then in brown, you can see uh, our newly launched sector standards. Um, we have recently launched several sectors, including oil and gas, coal, and um, agriculture, aquaculture, and fishing. And there's about 37 more sector standards or sectors in the pipeline uh, to, be, to be developed. Um, and then uh, on the right, we have the, the 31 topic specific standards and they're all grouped according to whether they're you know, economic, or largely economic, environmental or, or social topics. Um, so I just wanna go into the universal standards a bit because these were updated um, and released late last year and they comprise um, three standards. That's GRI 1 foundation, GRI 2 general disclosures, and GRI three material topics. That's but for those that are experienced reporters, that's replacing GRI one, GRI two, 101, 102, and one hundred and three. And this is actually where a reporter would start um, if reporting with the GRI standards. So GRI one um, is essentially what I would say your guidebook. Um, that it, it it really it's this it, it's a, it's a spot that's where it clarifies the um, the key concepts, um, reporting principles, and really just explains how how to use uh, the standards. It also lists the requirements um, that an organisation might comply with to report um, in in accordance with the GRI standards. Um, GRI two that's um, that's the general disclosures, that's, that really contains the disclosures that are related to details about an organization's structure and reporting practices. Um, so it's activities and workers, it's governance, um, policies, practices, um, and also a piece about stakeholder engagement in there. The, the disclosures um, in GRI2 really give insight into an organization's profile and, 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 and its scale um, and helps in providing that context for then understanding um, an organization's impacts. Um, GRI three material topics, um, that explains the steps by which an organization can determine um, the topics most uh, relevant to its impacts. Um, and uh, another update to the standards is that they actually now uh, reflect the highest expectations for uh, responsible, uh, responsible business conduct um, as according to um, you know, the UN and the OECD. So if um, there is uh, another call, uh, sort of, I guess, major change and experienced reporters will notice this one, is that there's only now one way to report in accordance with the GRI standards. Um, this more, I think, more simplified approach replaces what we saw before, which was with the reporting in accordance with the core and the comprehensive options. Um, and of course, an organization can always still report um, with reference to the GRI standards. Um, I want to dive into this little bit here. Chai, you uh, mentioned materiality, how it's such a key part of, um, of reporting. Um, with the release of the updated universal standards, um, they're, they're, it comes with it, a revised approach to um, materiality. Um, and in, and in GRI 3 uh, material topics, uh, we provide actual guidance to, um, suggested guidance as to how an organization can identify and prioritize its impacts um, in order to determine its material, topic, material topics. And that's shown there in the um, second box on, uh, from the left. So the first uh, three steps there um, suggested in the process really relate to the organization's ongoing and, um, and regular identification and assessment of, of impacts. So it's during these steps 
which, which are generally actually part of an organisation's day-to-day activities um, and its continuous engagement with relevant stakeholders. It's through this process that an organisation is generally identifying and assessing its impacts quite regularly. Um, and so these first three steps are generally conducted independently of the sustainability of reporting process because they're happening all the time. But they are necessary to help inform the last step, uh, which you see there is step four, where the organisation needs to prioritise um, its most significant topics for reporting. And in this way, it determines its material topics. Um, then to see the process through um, in, on reporting information, uh, to report in accordance with the GRI standards, there are disclosures which um, an organisation is required to report on. And this includes disclosures from GRI 2, GRI 3, and disclosures um, from those topic standards that are related to um, its identified material topics. Um, and just to mention, because they will be released over time, but when you have uh, sector standards, um, these will also include additional um, you know, sector disclosures and recommendations. Um, and then we go on further in process is to develop the content index and um, your statement of claim and then publish and notify GRI. Um, I know, actually, let me just go back to that one. I, I know I'm racing through, through this, um, but I think the, the most important thing to remember is that the sustainability process really is a process. Um, it's not a tick box exercise. It's not there to just be something you may do once, once a year and then wait for the next year to come around. Um, it really is a process. And by following the principles outlined in the process, it can be a super effective tool um, for businesses to, to understand their impacts, you know, identifying where there may be room for um, improvement or, you know, or even opportunities to contribute uh, positively to um, sustainable development. Um, I um, look, there's loads of benefits, but the only real point that I, I want to make here is that the GRI standards do integrate and reference um, global policy, and a number of governments and market regulators use the GRI standards um, to reference or to, to require uh, the use of the standards. Um, as, G as Shea pointed out, um, we have been working with EFRAG and um, the EU to advise on their draft European Sustainability Reporting Standards, or the ESRS. Um, these standards uh, are underpinned by the concept of double materiality, meaning companies um, need to report on both the financial implications of sustainability issues, as well as um, their own impacts on the world. The latter obviously being sort of GRI's uh, exclusive focus. So anyone who has gone through the draft uh, ESRS that's, that's currently out there, um, you know, uh, you'll see a layer of GRI influence there and we'll be continuing to work with, um, with FRAG over the few coming months to, to align um, as much as possible. Um, what we are, uh, we, we are getting a lot of questions from, from reporters um, and it's, it's worth noting that um, Anyone who is currently already reporting with GRI standards are likely to be in a really good position once the ESRS comes out. Um, and for those that aren't yet reporting, then it, we would be suggesting, look, get started on the GRI standards now because it's going to set you up really well um, to be ready when the time um, for mandatory reporting comes, which um, Shay's timeline is very soon. Um, and... Um, Sorry, I'm just on the, I think I skipped through a few on a, on a, on a, on a slide, but um, there's, you know, I guess uh, what, what GRI really does is, you know, we, we are really about promoting uh, alignment. And this slide that I've currently got here really shows you know, a bit more about how and where we align in the landscape. Uh, what's important for us um, at GRI is the standards are compatible with, you know, with, with the other principles, um, other standards and frameworks in the landscape. And to this end, we also try our best to support users of the GRI standards to be able to align their reporting where possible. Um, we do that through linking, through issue, issuing linkage documents, such as with the TCFD, the SDGs, um, the CDP, or through joint publications, like what we did together um, last year with SASB, um, which shows how organisations can report using both, um, both standards. 
Uh, we understand that there's you know, a demand coming from numerous stakeholders for particular sustainability information, say it's you know, for the financial markets. So, you know, I, I would sort of say, you know, the best way to consider GRI's place in, um, in, in, in the landscape is to imagine it's, it's like a backbone. And then when you, then you can bring in components of the other standards, questionnaires or, or frameworks to address those particular, you know, stakeholders with their you know, additional or, or specific information needs. Um, just one further resource, which is really popular, um, gets downloaded a lot from our website, are these publications we co-created with the UNGC on reporting on the SDGs. Um, so these are tools and resources that really help um, companies to identify, um, you know, to measure and really manage their SDG contributions. Um, there's a link uh, down the bottom there, and I know this, I think this slide pack may be shared afterwards, but um, you can follow the, the resources there. And um, just lastly, a very quick slide on some of the areas that, that we do at GRI look to support organisations um, and sustainability practitioners. Uh, we, we understand that the um, standards need to be overwhelming. Uh, we have a number of services that support in specific areas like, um, you know, like if you wanted to perform a health check on your content index, or um, we also uh, promote, uh, well, there are also various sort of reporting tools, including third party um, software applications, which can help you to really manage your disclosures and create you know, really, really good reports. Um, and we also have, um, for those that want to you know, uh, become certified or, or, or learn more, deep dive deeper into the standards, we have our online learning platform called the GRI Academy. Um, and just finally, um, I just want to wish, point out in pink, in pink there, the GRI community, which is our network of um, fabulous corporations and consultancies like, like Clearstream Solutions. Um, who are really looking to, you know, to lead on sustainability efforts and you know, with whom together we learn um, and, and share best practice to, uh, to really jointly advance corporate transparency. Um, and so with that, um, and looking at the time, I will hand back to you, Shane. Thanks a million, Kate. That was really comprehensive. Uh, I'm a big advocate of, of the GRI standards. And I think if you follow them, you will produce a very impressive sustainability report. Uh, so <laughs> um, we will keep working with our companies, uh, sending them that message. Uh, now, now I'd like to, to um, invite online uh, Cormac Madden, uh, Environmental and Sustainability Manager with ESB. Um, I think many of you will probably know Cormac. Uh, they're ESB or no stranger to sustainability reporting. They were originally a, a member of the, the EU Emissions Trading Platform Scheme. Um, they've been responding to, to CDP since 2009, and, and Cormac is on the CDP Ireland Network Committee. And they've also produced, been producing sustainability reports since Cormac thinks 2008. Um, so thanks for joining us, Cormac. And we're, we also have Susie Crawford, who's ESG Reporting and Research Manager with Karen Holmes PLC. Uh, Karen are a little bit newer than ESB to the, the process, um, but they've been responding to CDP since 2020, um, published their inaugural sustainability report last year, and they're currently working towards GRI alignment. So welcome to both of you and thanks for taking the time. Um, Susie, I might come to you first just to introduce yourself, uh, your role in terms of reporting in Cairn um, and the, the reporting journey you've been on to date. Sure. Um, hi Shay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so where, where to start? Uh, so maybe a bit about Cairn Homes as a background. Um, Cairn Homes is a PLC, we've, we're, we're a relatively young company, only in existence since 2015 in fact. Um, so since then about Five and a half thousand families have moved into a care and home. Um, and so we feel a real sense of responsibility to those customers and, and to the wider community. Um, my own role, I'm responsible for, for ESG reporting at Cairn um, and for kind of driving the ESG strategy and agenda at Cairn overall. Um, like one question people have often is, is where 
what what brought about this focus so where it might have been quite natural for for ESB to be thinking about this since as early as 2008 long before Karen even existed um it what what brought about this this way of thinking for Karen Holmes and that really it came that initially as a push from investors in 2019 to move away from the traditional kind of CSR view of the world um, and to start thinking more in terms of risk and resilience and, and reporting. Um, and beyond that, there's a real drive from the ground up. So it seems in Cairn, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call are probably experiencing the same thing, that individuals are really more focused on sustainability and environmental issues in particular now and um, becoming there is more personal activism coming to the fore um, so it was a combination of the drive from the investors that kind of um, uh, like personal passion in this kind of thing so if you think of Cairn we would have people who are qualified as architects, people who are planners who think about town planning, think about how can we make spaces more comfortable and more livable and how can we lessen our impact on the environment. Um, and then the third part is, is quite natural and it links to both is what would the ultimately be the impact on our brand if we could capitalize on all of that stuff that's ongoing and if we could find a way to communicate all the great things that we're doing even now even before we have it in a strategy back to investors um so that's that's where it came from um i've probably gone over my oh, two minutes thanks so Susie. Fast back yeah um and cormac yourself uh yeah and um, th thanks very much shay th thanks for having me here um i'd agree very much with what susie is saying and i was just thinking as she was talking that very similar to karen uh, once you're reporting, it doesn't matter how long. I suppose it's, it's a language, it's a tool. So um, our strategy has changed a couple of times in recent years to get ever more focused on uh, social and environmental issues, and especially, of course, our biggest impact, which is carbon. And it's kind of accelerated during that time. And we've used the sustainability report during that period to explain to people why we were doing this and what it was all about, why we thought this was important. So it's a, it, it's a really good vehicle to kind of set out the purpose of the company and um, explain that to people in, in, I suppose, in kind of clear English. And then, because to show it's not greenwashing, to, to put the actual metrics behind it and show how it all lines up. So um, I suppose that's really how we see reporting. My, my role in it is really just making sure the sustainability report gets out, which is, I think lots of people have the experience, that's a, a feat in itself every year. And right now um, we're starting up a project to try to uh, make this more integrated and more easy to do. So the metrics are more available earlier and more frequently and to weave it more into what we do as a company. So um, looking at EU standards coming and I won't, won't get into them or anything, but we kind of reflected on that for a while and we kind of thought, well, if we're going to have to change things to facilitate that, which makes sense to have audit trails in on all the data, not just the emissions. So auditors can look at them. And we kind of thought, well, we need to get some value out of that. So the idea was to turn the lens inwards as well. So our own people will be able to see all this information uh, on a much more timely basis. So we'll be using it to communicate inwards as well as outwards. So uh, that, yeah, I don't know if is that, that answers the question, but that's kind of where we are with reporting right now. It's kind of changing all the time. And, and, and how have you found the the adoption of these new frameworks and standards as they come out, is that kind of within your role? Do you have to sell those upwards and say, we need to integrate this into our report this year or TCFD, how do we do put this in? And uh, where does where does CDP sit within that report? And all of those kind of questions is that that, that falls yeah. within your remit? Uh, big question, but I suppose a simple way of putting that is, um, uh, a few years back, as, as you know, we started, we, we were disclosing for years against CDP, but we started to use it as we wanted to get more towards leadership. So we started to use the CDP questionnaires, as I call it, um, um, low cost consultancy in a way, because it had all the best practices in there. So we started adopting those one by one. And it was really myself and my team were doing that. Things were very different back then. Um, and we started kind of coming up the curve. So that was very useful. But in terms of new standards coming, um, the EU ones, uh, we're seeing those as mandatory. So yes, but that's an easy, an easy sell. And luckily I'm getting some help now. Um, there's a, a colleague kind of coming in with a project to kind of put some of the 
uh, measurements in place. Um, but for me, it's there's a huge amount of work in it, there's no doubt. But for me, it's a huge opportunity. I've been reading the standards and I've been very surprised really by just how practical they are. And all of the, they have a very similar approach, uh, very standardized. And it's all about, it looks like TCFT actually really for every single standard. So it's the approach of looking at it, looking at the impacts, setting targets, what is your policy in this area and uh, what are your plans really? And then there are some metrics, but not always, funny enough, it's more about how you do things. And I just see that as a huge opportunity that in the remaining areas in the company where really we can improve things a bit, I think we now have a framework and a bit of uh, impetus and momentum behind doing that. Um, so yeah, it, you know, if you're in my, sitting in a seat like mine um, or like Susie's, I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to get all the things in place that you want to get in. Thanks, Paul. Um, Susie, for, for you guys, how have you found, like you're, you're probably reflective of lots of people on the call, maybe thinking of responding to CDP and, and maybe just some thoughts on, 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 on that process and how you found, found uh, your work adopting some of these, these frameworks and standards. Um, might give a, a, a thanks, Cormac, by the way, for such positivity around the, the what's coming and what will be a legislative requirement. Often it's like, oh, is the reaction as well. So, ah, so I'm delighted to see that. Um, chronologically, maybe is the best way to describe our, our, um, our approach to reporting. So, um, the CDP questionnaire, we start out by doing the, the the minimal response that you do where you don't get a, a score, you just get used to the, the procedure and you do the, the, the minimum version of it. Um, then last year was the first year we answered the full questionnaire um, with the help of yourselves um, to break it down a bit. There was a lot, a lot to be learned from that whole process. It, it was a full-time job for, for a while there, going through all of the different questions and engaging across the business. So let's say on risks and opportunities, that's not up to me or someone in the ESG team just to write off our own, but we have to go out and engage and talk to people and and, and help them to think about sustainability and, and what are different risks, risks and opportunities that are out there. Um, so we replied, in the first instance last year and then starting again this year so our first score was a B so we're really hoping to get to a, a leader role this year but we'll see um, you never know how these things are going to turn out um, so then with regard to our sustainability report um, as you said we had the inaugural uh, sustainability maybe even to take it back a bit further than that actually we in 20 20 first started looking at materiality, undertaking a materiality assessment, um, published a sustainability section within the annual report that didn't provide metrics, that didn't provide data per se, that just described some case studies and said, here's the outcome of our materiality assessment. Here's what we're planning to do for the next 12 months, which is determine which framework is suitable to, for us and begin to collect the data. And then last year was the first time that we published data um, and to that end we had um, set out our material themes aligned whatever we were reporting so we, we knew they were material but aligned them to our purpose to make it easier for everyone to understand so the purpose our purpose at Karen is building homes and creating places where people love to live and so the very creative people who I work with drew out the kind of three key themes in, within that which are people homes and places and so we can neatly enough actually align everything within our sustainability journey to that purpose um, and so the frameworks to bring it back to the specifics of, of what you love so much Shay, <laughs> is we we first looked at SASB but for our sector there's only 13 or 14 um, asks really and it didn't cover the the breadth of what we consider to be material actually so what they considered to be material was as you say it's quite investor focused it's relatively narrow um, and it, it didn't align to what had come out of our, our sustainability report so where we went beyond that where we had data and where we felt that it was material then we used the GRI standards to help us to make sure that we were calculating things in a way that was comparable to everybody else and that, that we were you know not setting out this is the Cairn Homes definition of x y or z that it was that it was aligned to, 
to um, a kind of an internationally recognized standard, which was really helpful to us. Um, and then we also reported on TCFD for the first time this year. So as a PLC, that's a, a really important thing to report. Um, our TCFD response was both in our sustainability report and uh, repeated again in full in the annual report so that for that particular audience, there's, a, there's that repetition there. And so next year, what we're looking at is an integrated annual and sustainability report, sustainability data flowing right through the report, sustainability information front and center with, with some of the financial KPIs, but also a separate, extracting all of that and repeating it in one place so that if a person only wants to see our sustainability reporting, they know exactly where to go. There's a document that has that and, and no, no other extraneous stuff, just the sustainability. So brilliant, thanks. That's, that's our journey to date. Yeah, uh, as, a, as an avid reader of sustainability reports, um, those frameworks and strategies are really important. And the more simple, the better <laughs> uh, for if you have a good plan up front or, or map nearly, you can find anything you need to within the report because there is such a huge amount of information and a lot of it is really positive and companies have so much to talk about it talk about but you do have to be a little bit selective and make sure it aligns to 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 your material topics and, and to make sure you're even if you don't have something to say but the topic is material that you're at least stating that be transparent and, and say that um that 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 this is an area you need to do work on um but it, it, it it's an important topic to your your company um, Cormac, just a question for you in terms of uh, the move towards uh, integrating financial and non-financial uh, in information. Uh, it's 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 kind of a a key a key element of the 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 new CSRD. Uh, so yeah, what are you what what are your do you, do you, are you as positive about that as you are about the, the, the general standards or um, yeah, any insight you have into that would be great. Um, yeah, I, I would say I'm positive. I don't see it as maybe quite as profound and that could be, I'm still starting to read the standards so I might be missing out on something. I really like the fact that uh, when you're reporting uh, your climate risks and opportunities uh, and I should have mentioned, I didn't get around to mentioning, we do TCFD as well, although we, we have a bit to go yet to get the full financial impacts. But when you're reporting on those um, and you give a financial impact, um, you then have to link it to the part in your accounts where that would be relevant to that impact. So I, I think that's a really good link. Um, I think the useful thing is bringing the financial people more into it um, because it's still, um, they're very, in our company, they're very involved in the taxonomy. They're driving that, uh, which I think is the right thing, uh, linking in with us on interpretation. But there's still, you know, we still haven't got the full integration. So I think it's a big help for that. But it doesn't strike me as all that, in some ways, all that profound, um, because we, you know, we will still have the environmental and social reporting metrics to look after and to make sure they're correct and so on. Um, but I think um, what's really good here, though, is that um, we have to tell our story in one piece. So, um, when you look underneath the EU thing, and it's it's very clever, very well worked out, a lot of brilliant minds, I'm sure. But um, beneath it all, all they're really saying is that you have to integrate your, your financial, social and environmental reporting and impacts and way of looking at the world. So everything has to be looked through, looked through the three lenses. And therefore, bringing the financial and social and economic together, you have to, because and um, financial is only one aspect of your impact. And depending what kind of company you are, it might be the least impact you have on, on that. You know, it might be leaving devastating impacts on the planet or in communities. Um, so I like, I think the philosophy has been very powerful and we're looking to apply that way of thinking internally so that we're not just reporting. Now this, this is a long-term aim, I'm not saying we're there, but we're not just reporting in an integrated way, uh, we're getting upstream into our business processes so that uh, by the time we report, it'll be, it'll be good. There's yeah. no point just doing the reporting. And, and I think a lot of people see that as a summit in itself. It's not. Uh, so we've been looking to see, can we integrate back in those principles into throughout the company? And I think that's a hugely positive thing. And I think financial people, now we're having this discussion within the company and I'm sure a lot of companies, 
they're they're not fully persuaded yet, but I think they have a huge role to play in pulling the thing together because in certainly in our company, I think in a lot of companies, they're the people who kind of apply the processes and are the gatekeepers and they make sure people provide the information they're supposed to and they put the management reports together. So it's completely appropriate that they pull the whole thing together. So I like the overall philosophy. I'm not sure in reporting it'll change things that radically having a linkage, you know. I, th I think because you already have the finance people at the table, maybe you see it, you don't see it as quite as influential, but I think there are lots of companies that haven't even got their finance teams to this this table and and, and that needs to be done. So um, for those companies online, if you have your sustainability team set up, <laughs> make sure you have a, a, a finance person um, in, in, in the group. Um, I'm really conscious of time. Uh, I had loads more questions to ask. Kate, I just wanted to come to you to finish because I'm I'm conscious there's a there's a, a question as well in the in the chat, and that was about GRI's work um, at the at the global level with the the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so if you have any more insight um, from that perspective uh, from the work GRI is doing, I know it's front and center in both the EU and at a global level. That would be great. Yeah, certainly, and, it, and it's probably the, you know, the, the, the global trend we're seeing around the strengthening of, of financial um, sustainability related financial uh, disclosures. So a few months ago, um, as the chat rightly um, points out, we uh, GRI signed an MOU with the IFRS Foundation to work much more closely together on standard setting um, to make sure really that this connection between what we're calling the two pillars um, so the impact reporting and sustainability, uh, financial sustainability reporting um, continues to be much more proactively addressed. So in practice, um, what does this mean? Um, it means we'll be looking at things like, you know, how do we make it easier for um, companies to comply and start to align some of the, of the stuff we each do in order to, um, in order to really sort of make the landscape no more complex than, than it needs to be. Um, we, we know, and, and this will be like, you know, we joined each other's technical groups already. We're starting to align on what we do around language or understanding of, of, of particular concepts. Um, you know, ultimately it's, it's, it's going to be for everyone's benefit if we can have something that is comparable, like a comprehensive system that is comparable, consistent and, um, and presenting balanced data so you know that that's where we're looking to head head with that and um certainly where you know that the, the relationship is, is 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 off to a really positive start brilliant thank you you've left me with a a minute to spare there um so i don't i don't think there was any other questions in uh so i'd just like to thank you for joining us Kate um it, it's been really good to have the, the relationship with GRI and be able to bring that to the companies we work with um and to Cormac and and Susie thanks for all your insight I think it's it, it's really really good to hear uh from people who are managing reporting you're working right across both your businesses to pull all this information together every year um it's it, it's quite the task um and to keep up with everything that's happening so um yeah uh Hello, <laughs> I think we lost oh he's back oh he's back yeah so thank you both for or thank you to all of you for your for your time today and to everyone online thanks for joining and i hope you uh found it beneficial and we'll uh hopefully run a similar one next year so thank you thanks bye. for you bye, bye. bye ryan <laughs>